Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. Today I want to expand on my most recent video talking about Credit Suisse and the position they've got themselves in. In the last video, I sort of went over essentially why Credit Suisse, I believed at the time or yesterday, um, why the statements that people were making on Twitter that they're basically about to go bankrupt and it's going to cause a financial crisis like 2008 was massively overstated that if you looked at their actual regulatory filings that the capital requirements that they were meeting as a, according to the Basel 2 and 3 Accord were actually very strong and you know we didn't really need to worry. In this video I want to sort of go deeper into that point. Before we get started there, let's, if I share my screen we can see that the Credit Suisse is as of sort of at the beginning of trading within an hour of trading five-year credit default swaps had jumped to 355 basis points up 105 basis points from friday's close so that's one thing clearly people are sort of worried about credit swiss at one point or another they think that there's a likelihood that the the, the bank bank uh, goes bankrupt or defaults on its credit so first of all we're going to talk about how this whole crisis started or at least this fake crisis because it started with a really interesting twitter account that came out with just one tweet and it started this whole panic over the weekend then we're going to go over credit suisse's balance sheet especially their assets in the form of loans we're going to go through them and figure out you know what is the actual risk weighted asset how is that uh, calculated why is it important and secondly i'm going to reiterate why they've got good capital requirements and why we shouldn't worry. I'm gonna try and do this video very quickly, so let's get started. The issue that we really have in the markets is who propagates the original myth that Credit Suisse is going down. And it all starts with a guy called David Taylor. He tweets something called, he tweets something that goes along the lines of, credible sources tell me a major international investment bank is on the brink. People, rightly so, look at that and they say, what investment bank is out there that's trading terribly? And they look and they search Barclays, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. And what do they come across? Two banks, Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank. Their stock price has gone down. Um, they're not performing very well. They're losing money. They're not having a great time. They're finding it extremely competitive. And they really need to restructure. You know, Many financial um, news channels are mentioning that today, funny enough. So they're seeing that and they're just assuming this guy means it's either Credit Suisse or Deutsche Bank. But the truth is, is that this guy doesn't really know. He's just come out with it. Today, it was released a, a tweet by ABC business journalist David Taylor suggesting a major international investment bank was on the brink was deleted on Monday afternoon. Around the same time, the public broadcaster said it, rem it reminded the reporter of its social media guidelines. Taylor's October the 1st tweet fed a social media frenzy of rumours, misinformation and unverified claims that a European investment bank, Credit Suisse or Deutsche Bank, could be set to collapse and spark the biggest financial crisis since 2009. And it goes on to say an ABC spokesman said that the journalist made the comment after an exchange with a financial analyst. His managers have discussed the matter with him and have reminded him of ABC's social media guidelines, the spokesman said. So, what does that mean? It means that this whole frenzy of fear that everybody was getting themselves involved in, social comment, uh, sorry, financial comment commentators on social media pages like Graham Stefan and other would-be finance Twitter experts have gone crazy because maybe they lack an imagination or they sort of they're so in love with the idea of another big short that they sort of basically want it to come true. Basically, that they've 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 believed the guy who was quoting a financial analyst, an analyst, not somebody who's like senior in Credit Suisse who knows the, the, the bankers sort of written or underwritten really risky assets and bet on it and it's about to collapse. Nope, a financial analyst who's probably looked at their, their income statement, their cash flow statement and said, you know what, this company is probably going to die. But not in the sense that it's another financial crisis where they've, they've bet all their assets on one risky trade with a massive amount of leverage. So, all in all, I fear that when markets, whether it be the stock market, the bond market, begin to react to false news, fake news even, on Twitter, and they run with it, the problem is, is that you get the effect that we're having today. 
more and more people believe it's going to happen. They begin to react as if it's going to happen, meaning that they withdraw their money from Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse, and it basically forces the event to occur. But anyway, I digress. So next thing we want to do is we want to go over their assets to figure out what is their risk weighted asset? How is it calculated? And what really are they at risk to? Let's go into that in a bit more detail. So if I share my screen, we've got a an exhibit that comes from their investors presentation from the most previous quarter, which is 2Q 2022. And we can see that they have, um, if I can actually get the highlighter, $274 billion in um, in risk weighted assets and predominantly majority of that comes from credit risk which is worth approximately 185 billion dollars pretty much what you would expect from a bank because as you know they lend money that is pretty much what they do i mean if you expected anything else i'd be surprised um fourth quarter 2021 they had 183 billion dollars in credit risk so it has gone slightly up, as you would probably expect. Moving on now, we go through um, the definition of a risk-weighted asset, which comes from their own um, investors' presentation. I will expand on it, but I want to quickly read it out to you so you understand the full picture. Um, here we are. So it says, our balance sheet's position and off-balance sheet exposure translate into translates into RWA, which are categorized as credit, market, and operational risk-weighted assets. When assessing risk-weighted asset, it is not a nominal size, but rather the nature, including risk mitigation, such as collateral or hedges, of the balance sheet positions or off-balance sheet exposure that determines the RWA. So, explaining that um, in a little bit more detail for you, if I just sort of go to the side here. Okay, so to understand risk-weighted assets just a little bit more, I'm going to quickly just draw it out. So, as we know, a bank has various different assets on its balance sheet, but it will probably have two principal ones. And, and I'll write that here. So, if, if I just write assets, excuse my horrible handwriting, I know it's awful. Um, so, we've got assets and we'll have cash, right? We're familiar with that, or it will be money with the, the Fed or the central bank. Or, and we'll also have sort of a mortgage asset or just a loan, right? But we'll, we'll call it a mortgage because it's it's a certain type of asset. Um, and when we look at an asset, we want to add a risk weight to it, meaning that of that asset, how risky is it? And if we if we had to put a percentage on it, how out of 100%, how risky is it? So for instance, cash, well, it's cash. There is no risk to cash. We're holding it in our own back pocket, our own bank account. So we would assume cash has a 0% risk weight, whereas a mortgage, depending on the underlying risk factors of that mortgage or of that portfolio of mortgages, it can have a risk weight of 50%. So if we just assume a mortgage has, the mortgage debt for Credit Suisse has 50% risk weighted asset, or risk weight in, sorry, and let's say our assets, just those two combined was 100 billion uh, pounds, I'm gonna use pounds in this instance, but I should really be using dollars, well, then cash would be worth 0%. Uh, actually, let's assume that cash was worth 50 billion and mortgages was worth 50 billion. Because cash was 50 billion times 0%, well, that obviously equals 0% or $0 or zero pounds. Whereas the mortgage, because it is worth 50%, it's actually worth 25 billion. So overall, we would say in this instance that my fake bank or Credit Suisse in this example has 25 billion in risk weighted assets. So now you understand the picture. So we know the banks are mainly at risk to loans. It's what they do is the principal part of a bank's activities is to essentially make a market and hand out loans. We want to know what are they loaning out? What is it? And what are they really at risk to? And no surprise here, if we just look at their numbers, they're primarily at risk to um, mortgages of consumer loans that they've handed out, everything above that line just there. 109 billion in mortgages. They've got 45 billion in loans collateralized by securities, which is not too bad. And in terms of the corporate and institutional uh, loan making, Majority of that risk comes from commercial and industrial loans. So why is this important? Well, because we know that we're about to go through a very interesting period in time where mortgages or the value of mortgages are likely to be stressed. Meaning that um, if we loaned out, let's say my house for, let's say my house when I purchased it, even though these are just fake figures, let's say it was 400K when I purchased it and I took out a loan, <coughs> a 50% loan on it, 200K. 
good. I've got 200k in principle before it goes down. But let's say in a completely crazy scenario that we get a more than 50% correction. My house is now worth 200k and it's got 200k debt against it. Or it goes lower than 50% and it's now worth 180k. The bank is now down substantially. It's down by 20k and that's quite a big write down. And we can see that across the board, depending on whatever assets they've been underwriting. So mortgages, in my opinion, just looking at these numbers here, look to be slightly vulnerable. I mean, obviously, this will have mortgages backdated for many, many years and at very good rates. Of course, majority of that 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 mortgage debt comes from the Swiss bank. Oh, uh, comes from the Swiss bank. I can actually use the bloody tool here comes from the Swiss bank which has 96 billion dollars in mortgage debt on their books whereas for the corporate and institutional loans that comes primarily from both the wealth management division and the Swiss bank which by the way if you wanted to know Swiss bank by the way has the biggest amount of assets but also is the most profitable so taking that in if you just consider the fact that obviously the Swiss bank makes all of the loans but has primarily the greatest amount of profitability then you begin to think, well, actually, is Credit Suisse really at risk or is somebody lying here? So how bad is the underwriting? Or, or in other terms, how many impairments do they have to make per loan? And I've already annotated this just to speed it up. But we can see that they've got approximately three billion pounds or three billion dollars even in impaired loans this quarter. And that is up from 2.7 billion the previous quarter. Oh, sorry, in fourth quarter 2021. So an increase of $300 million, which, I mean, is a lot, but, I mean, $3 billion in impairments against, what was it? It was $3 million against 287. Let's just round up for 300. 1% of impairments, 1% of impaired impairments for the amount of loans you've got. I don't think that's too bad. I think that's more than... Than capable. I mean, they have enough reserves, for instance, to actually deal with this. Going on, we want to now look at one major point, and we want to go back to something I touched on yesterday, which was their capital reserves. What have they put aside in case something goes wrong? So here we've got on the page something called the exceeding both gone and gone concern requirements um, slide deck page. Essentially, this means that how much money has Credit Suisse got in their in their balance sheet, in their company, put to the side for a rainy day when things melt down, when depositors have been rinsed, when all their their their, their assets have been rinsed. How much money have they got put to the side to deal with really bad scenarios? And according to the Basel Two and Three Accord uh, or Acts, there's two types of events. You've got the going concern and the gone concern. Going concern is the first tier, meaning that. Um, the bank is in trouble, it's in financial difficulty, and it has this money to use desperately in order for to, to have some liquidity, meaning that they can dip into that when times get tough. And the reason why these things exist, by the way, the reason why we have such reserves is because 2008 was made worse by the fact that no bank would lend to one another. So therefore, they must have good reserves in order to prevent that from occurring in the future. And as we can see here, if we just look at the bottom, of this um, nice little bar, uh, Credit Suisse has a total of $37 billion of CET, oh, I've got the, the uh, rubber there, $37 billion of CET1 capital, or, you know, tier one capital. This is very liquid cash or treasuries. They've also got $15.7 billion in AT1. So, so technically, they've got a very nice tier one cushion, okay? And, and they've also got gone concern capital. This is basically the company is about to go bankrupt. They've got no money. They basically need bailing out ASAP. And that's of, that's worth 400, uh, sorry, $44.2 billion. Now, just to the right here, it will tell you approximately how much Credit Suisse has against the Swiss capital requirements. So just for tier one, they've, they've got 13.5%, but they are only mandated to have 9.6% in tier one capital which is pretty good. I mean, they'll even say here, their near-term uh, intention is to go to 13 to 14%, and they've got that. And they want to go above 14.5%, or sorry, 14% with the pre-Basel 3 reform. Going above that, they've also got a 
tier, uh, the AT1 requirement of 5.7%, which is greater than the 4.3% of the Swiss co uh, banks, the Swiss capital um, requirements mandate them to have. To go further than that, they also have as as sort of the gone concern capital a 16.1%, which is greater than the 13.9% that they're required to have. Now, I, although I'm just reading out these numbers to you, um, and they might not mean like much, the point is, is to say that, and the reason why I'm making this video is to say that just by digging deep into the balance sheet of Credit Suisse and understanding the, the, the measures they take to be risk averse or to have enough risk on the table that they can manage, you can see that they're making they're making the correct decisions. Even though operationally they're not so great and they're not so profitable, the actual business themselves, they're actually being quite prudent. And you can see that just there. So I think this subject is over. I won't be talking about it much more unless something material happens or another frenzy occurs. But for me, I feel like there is no need to worry about this topic as much. I think we've got more interesting debates about Tesla and other businesses across across the world and in the stock market and the macro economy in general, I don't think we need to worry about Credit Suisse or Deutsche Bank. So anyway, guys, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I want to say I really appreciate everybody who has subscribed. Um, my last video did really well, as, as I said. And admittedly, it was a surprise to me, but I'm really glad people enjoyed it. So if you want to subscribe, I'd appreciate it. Um, if I've missed anything that you think is really important, please leave it in the comment section below. I'm always replying. I'm always, um, um, I'm, I'm happy to accept feedback too. So I, I really appreciate anything. So thank you guys. And I'll see you in my video tomorrow. Bye for now.